And here we go. Welcome folks, as you're coming in, we're just gonna wait a few more minutes till we get to actual five and let folks get their audio hooked up. Welcome those of you who are just joining us. We're just going to wait another minute to let folks get themselves into the room fully. All right, let's start rolling. Welcome to the second lecture in the 2022 Innovation in the Berkshires Lecture Series. My name is Carol Almond morton and I am the Executive Director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. Ollie at BCC is a volunteer-driven program that is a non-credit learning community for adults 50 years old and better, including courses, special interest groups, lectures, and events in person and online. You can lear learn more at our website, which I'm gonna pop in the chat right now. And just so panelists know, I'm just gonna mute you just so that we don't get feedback. So don't be surprised. All right. Uh, in 2019, Ollie at BCC initiated a collaborative partnership with One Berkshire and the Berkshire Innovation Center, resulting in multiple lecture series to advance regional understanding and readiness in the field of emergent tech. We are so glad to be part of this initiative, which melds together key Ollie goals to learn and to contribute meaningfully to our community. You can learn more about our partner organizations, One Berkshire, and the Berkshire Innovation Center on their websites. And I'm gonna put those in the chat as well. Today's session will be recorded and posted on the OLLI YouTube page in case you miss anything, or if you might wanna share the link with a friend. And there's that link, it's the last one. <laughs> this series will continue Wednesdays through November 16th, and you're welcome to attend any and all of the lectures. In just a moment, I'm gonna turn things over to James Rosenstein, to introduce tonight's moderator. James is a member of the Tech Impact Collaborative team, a former business, business executive in Europe and former head of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce in New York. Thank you, Jim. And I'm just gonna put you up here one sec. Lovely, enjoy and thank you. And you'll need to unmute yourself because I muted you. Thank you. Okay, Carol, thank you very much. Uh, it is really a pleasure and an honor to introduce this event on behalf of the Tech Impact Collaborative and Ali. Um, it's a very topical subject. It's um, the fact is a low carbon energy industry is coming. And what does that mean for the Berkshires? Massachusetts and most states in the Northeast US have aggressive greenhouse gas reduction goals enacted into law. These goals will drive huge changes in how we produce, transmit, and consume energy. Production from renewable and non-carbon resources will increase dramatically. Society will have to wean itself off fossil fuels, for example, internal combustion engines and heating and cooling systems, and increase non-emitting electricity consumption, for example, electric vehicles, commercial and residential buildings, homes, built structures, and others, and use the power it does consume more efficiently. The increase in supply and demand of electricity consumption will entail upgrading our electric transmission and distribution system. The Berkshires have seen some of these changes with wind and solar farms and EV charging stations, but much more is coming. Now, it's an honor for me to introduce you to our moderator, Mr. Tom Michaelman. He is the Senior Director in Distributed Energy Resources, DER Practice Area Lead at Sustainable Energy Advantage. 
He has over 28 years of experience in electric industry and renewable retail and wholesale energy markets. So Tom, it's a pleasure to hand over to you to proceed with our event. And thank you again. Thank you, James. Thank you, Ollie, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen and we will start a presentation where I will kick off today. So hold on a minute. I'm going to share screen two. Okay, share. And then Can everybody see the slide deck? A thumbs up might be good. Great. Okay, good. So um, obviously you all know the title and what the uh, focus is. And you know, the question might be, you know, why am I your moderator? Um, well, James Odie noted that I've been in the renewable energy industry for a long time in the energy industry. I've been doing participating in the energy industry since 1993 and in the renewable energy industry since 2003. And you look at um, some people in the industry and um, very old. Um, so I work for a firm called Sustainable Energy Advantage, and we are um, market analysts. Uh, we have lots of different types of clients, and we um, provide all sorts of services uh, analyzing uh, clean and renewable energy markets around the Northeast. Um, we do a lot of uh, regulatory policy, legislative analysis, and then quantitative analysis of what are the impacts of uh, different incentives and legislative initiatives. Uh, regardless, you probably don't want to know too much about our firm. They're probably not going to buy our services, so I'm going to move on. So I want to give you the big picture of what's going on with decarbonization. Um, so we're looking at, um, in the case of what the status is for mass decarbonization and its near-term outlook. Um, let me just hold on one moment. Great. Um, So we had a couple of important legislative initiatives in Massachusetts. And we're going to look at this from a Massachusetts perspective, obviously, um, given the Berkshires. We have the Global, Solution, Global Warming Solutions Act of 2008. And you can see that requires um, a decrease in uh, statewide emissions. Um, below 1990 levels, um, 10 to 25% below uh, 1990 levels by 2020, and 80% below those 1990 levels by 2050. Um, that was updated um, from regulations that emanated from an act creating a next generation roadmap for Massachusetts climate policy. Um, and that, of course, amended the Global Warming Solutions Act. And it provided some more short-term mileposts. Uh, you can see the 33% decrease in greenhouse gas emission reductions are required by 2025 and 50% by 2030. So all of that is in legislative and um, you know, it, it needs to, um, there needs to be plans and clear um, 
methods to get to those reductions. Uh, so plans did come out and this here is the um, plans in aggregate. You can see, let's see if I can do this. I'm gonna get a laser pointer out here. Um, you can see how the greenhouse, if you look here, these little diamonds are the greenhouse um, Global Warming Solutions Act emission limits for 1990. This is the baseline. Um, and then for 2020, 2025, and 2030, um, these are the different sectors, um, electricity, buildings, transportation, and non-energy industrial. And you can see here are the short-term plans for getting those reductions. I'm just going to try to get this out of my hair. Great. Okay. So um, we have a transportation. It was the biggest uh, contributor to greenhouse gases in Massachusetts. And that's at 37% of the 2020 emissions. Um, you can see from 1990, actually emissions went up. Um, this is million tons of CO2 equivalent. Um, it went up and then is scheduled or has gone down as of 2020. And, um, or, and then actually goes up again. And then hopefully by 2030, we'll go down. So then we're talking, we're talking that what are the reduction strategies to decrease transportation emissions? Uh, so reducing the vehicle miles travel, um by doing by providing alternatives so that would be mass transit um active transportation like walking and bicycling transit oriented development meaning you put development near transit um e-bikes and the like and then <clears throat> Really importantly, is you have to transition most vehicles on the road to electric vehicles. So one would do that by fleet electrification, increasing uh, mass market electric vehicle sales, and of course you have to invest in charging infrastructure. For buildings, you can look at the same graphic um, and look at the total reductions. There have been reductions since 1990, currently, or as of 2020, and we're looking at much more reductions by 2025 and even more by 2030. So the primary strategies for, for this, uh, for, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in buildings is improving energy efficiency. And one does that by updating building codes, um, expanding mass save, which is the primary um, utility funded, or utility bill funded um, provider of energy efficiency to end users in the state. Um, and converting to electric heat. So that would be electric heat pumps for heating or water heating. And you have to, of course, train workforce to install those technologies. Of course, if you're converting to electric heat, you have to assume that the electricity is going to be uh, low carbon as well. 
And that to that point, we're looking at electric power emissions. And you can see that already from 1990, we have decreased emissions 54%. So that's a pretty good win. Um, that has been done by lowering heat rates. That means the amount of lowering the amount of fuel per um, kilowatt hour produced. There's been a lot of coal plant retirements um, and there's been growth renewables. So in the future, we're gonna get there by additional offshore wind, imported to Canadian hydro and wind, or that's the plan. Um, increases in solar and storage means you have to increase and improve electric transmission and distribution group. So solar is one big way um, where we have gotten there and we're gonna get there. Um, you can see the growth of solar through 2017 in Massachusetts. Then we transitioned to a new program. The new program, the SMART program has been, um, is now ramping up and you can see more installations. This is just a fun map of as of 2019, where solar installations were in all over New England, and you can see uh, the densest amount of megawatts were in Massachusetts and Southern New England. And then here is a um, more dense shot or close in shot of where solar has been developed in Massachusetts. But this is of course, is 2019. Um, moving on from electricity reductions, we have industrial and non-energy source, which, which is 13% of 2020 emissions. Um, and you can see as of 2030, there has been 34% reduction from 1990 levels. Um, no expected decrease in 2025, but um, almost 50% by 2030. Um, and how we're gonna get there, we're gonna plug leaks from refrigeration systems, from switch gear, from natural gas pipelines, um, and capture waste gas from, additional waste gas from landfills and municipal waste. In the future, we're gonna to have to um, work on capturing hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, um, and work on additional ways of uh, capturing or not causing leaks from electric transmission equipment and other gas distribution. Uh, so there's other sequestration strategies, um, permanently conserve undeveloped land and water, and um, natural and working lands, um, enhance carbon sequestration on those lands. So that would include like better forestry management and green gateway city urban tree planting. Um, green hydrogen can be used as an alternative to building heating, hydrogen fuel cells, so for transportation and long duration storage. So overall, those are the strategies that the state is contemplating for getting to a low carbon environment. Um, and if we have any questions, we can take those. And be, as we do that, just one more slide. One should note that uh, the rest of today's focus with the speakers is gonna be on renewable energy, energy efficiency, and electric vehicles. But there's plenty of topics we're not gonna be a focus of today because then we would be here for 
six hours rather than one and a half. Uh, and that's renewable, other renewable energy resources, um, green hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, how to decrease vehicle mile travels, greenhouse gas leakage reductions, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, you know, that there's plenty to talk about in this domain, but um, we only have an hour and a half today. Okay, James. All right, I think um, there is one question uh, that's come up. Okay. Um, uh, wait a minute. Uh, there's one person who says, if I drive to Boston and then fly around the world, what part of the trip is counted in your data? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> well, I actually do have an idea. I know that the, the driving to Boston would be counted. I do not know if the flying, the, this, uh, the slides I showed were from not a study that we authored, but by um, other consultants um, who put together the roadmap. So I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. All right, no further questions for now. Okay. Um, okay, well then I believe I'm introducing the next pa panelist who is Tyler Fairbank. Tyler is the CEO of the Fairbank Group. Um, and they're an entity that manages Jiminy Peak, Mount Resort in Hancock, Mass, Cranmore Mountain Resort in North Conway, Ski Bromley in Peru, Vermont. Also has uh, another firm, EOS Ventures, which I'm Bull Wheel Productions, Snow Gun Technologies, and various other endeavors. Um, in addition, Tyler serves as president of Jim and Peak, overseeing day-to-day -day operations. So Tyler is going to focus on renewables in the Berkshires with real-life examples of green existing businesses and a renewable business in the Berkshires. So thank you, Tyler. All right. Great. Well, thank you. Nice to be with you all. And uh, I will be very specific in, in my uh, words, relatively brief, um, focusing on our work in the renewable energy space and also kind of what's transpired at a local business that some of you may be aware of, Jiminy Peak, and our efforts to um, be carbon neutral and um, you know sustainable. So let's take, no, I do not have my presentation. So let me turn it to Carol, who is going to run the show here. So um, uh, I will talk, let's go to the next slide. Um, let me talk quickly about the Fairbank Group. So we're really in four different business lines that would be important for today's discussion. And that is one, we are in the renewable, I'm sorry, we are in the, um, what I would call the outdoor recreation business, skiing or, you know, weddings or um, lodging, things that support and are directly involved in outdoor recreation. Um, and that would be at Jiminy Peak, at Bromley, at Cranmore, those are the three entities that make that leg of, of first of the four legs of the stool up. The second is we are in the, um, excuse me, um, we're in the world of condominium development as well. So um, uh, we have real estate development in all of our resort facilities. So that is another space that we're in. Thirdly, and probably most remain to this today's discussion, we're in the energy business. And that would be um, predominantly in the renewable energy space. And then fourth, we are in the technology arena as well and have a few business enterprises in that space. Um, Jiminy Peak in the Berkshires, um, we have moved to 100% renewable energy um, from projects that we have developed over time. 
And um, so that has been predominantly, as many people can see, the wind turbine that sits atop Jiminy that produces a little over 4 million kilowatt hours a year um, that we use um, really 50% of that energy is used by us right on site. Um, then we have a solar facility, which we um, brought to commercial operation um, as well. And that's about a 2.3 megawatt project, half of which um, is, is renewable energy that we have created ourselves and use ourselves. Um, we then also have a, uh, Cogen facility in the basement of their country in. And we have, um, in addition to those efforts to really um, bring renewables to the property, um, reduced the amount of, of energy that we use and that we call our conservation efforts. And um, so we've gone from about 10 million kilowatt hours a year worth of usage to about 6.2 million kilowatt hours a year worth of usage. And um, that's a pretty dramatic um, reduction. So, uh, you know, at Jiminy, we've really done a lot to move ourselves off of using power, being a big power user, um, move ourselves from using, remove the use of power from the grid. Um, and we've gotten to a point where we're now really, you know, using what we generate. EOS Ventures is another company that we have developed um, that, let me make sure that you all, yeah, okay. Um, so EOS Ventures, we've done about 30 megawatts worth of renewable projects in, I call it the Northeast, um, in New England and down in, into the Mid-Atlantic area. Um, most of that is um, been, well, we've got seven solar projects, and three wind projects in the Berkshires. So those are our point of reference for the Berkshires and the kind of what is possible and doable here. And what we find in the projects that we develop as an energy business is that financing is the biggest challenge for all of our projects. You know, it's not, you know, do we want more solar or do we want more wind or, you know, um, uh, storage is a big topic of conversation today. And, Quite frankly, that's the holy grail um, uh, for, for renewable energy. We're, we're looking at projects and finding that, that building them is not the biggest challenge. Siting them is not the biggest challenge, but financing them is really one of the biggest challenges that we are faced with. So let's go to the next slide. Um, gives you a little bit of the background of, of uh, kind of what we're, where we're coming from. Um, Wind projects in the Berkshires I've talked about, Jiminy Peak, um, and the development of a of a, a wind turbine at the top of Jiminy. Um, that turbine really was a launch point for uh, EOS Ventures to focus a relationship with GE and the and um, putting um, single turbines or smaller lots of turbines, um, one to say 10 or 12 turbines um, on location at a site. Um, you know, GE for the most part, and in many of Siemens or Vestas or any of the large producers of wind turbines, we're looking at, at lots of 100 to 200 to 300 wind turbines as, as a lot size. And obviously that's not citable here in the Berkshires or in New England or in the Northeast. We needed smaller lot sizes. And so the relationship that we were able to develop because of the Jiminy Peak project was, was paramount to getting those projects cited in the Northeast. And so Fox Island Wind, for instance, is a great example of another a wind project that took place off the coast of Maine that we were uh, the developer of, and the um, we acquired the turbines for that project, um, and that never really would have happened if it weren't for um, you know the Berkshires and Jiminy Peak playing a, kind of a lead dog role in in establishing that relationship with GE. Um, 
Berkshire Wind was another project. Many of you have seen that, I'm sure. You know, as you drive north to Williamstown and you look over on the ridge line, you can see a number of turbines. Those, um, uh, the, the first batch, which were 10 turbines, um, we installed. Um, they procured, we installed. Um, we, we did the construction management of that installation project, actually, is probably the more technical phrase. And um, that was a very interesting project because it was a project that that got a lot of notoriety. A lot of people saw it, it was quite visible. Um, and the power of the generation of all the wind turbines went to the eastern part of the state. And that was done through the Massachusetts uh, Electric Cooperative. And that was established as the Berkshire Wind um, uh, Collaborative Cooperative Project. And so it gave rise to the use of turbines in the Berkshires as a power generator. Um, but it was really kind of a, a big question mark. Well, will this be a solution for the Berkshires for the long haul? And that's a question I'll leave for later. Um, we've also done a lot of, of consulting work on local projects for you know, different wind turbines of different sizes, different manufacturers, and in about most, uh, the mountains of the Berkshires. And, you know, the Berkshires are interesting in that the northern part of Berkshire County has a greater wind resource. The southern part of Berkshire County does not have that great of a wind resource, uh, meaning that the wind doesn't blow in southern Berkshire County like it blows in northern Berkshire County. And the sites, the locations for wind development in Berkshire County are quite limited, unfortunately. Um, they're limited more to the northern part of the county. And I would say that Florida Mountain having the project developed and Berkshire Wind having developed what they developed, there's very few place sites left in Berkshire County to develop wind turbine projects. Um, so next slide, please. Um, that took our focus to really um, being more on solar. Um, and as you can see here, you know, we've, we've done a number of commercial solar projects that are currently on our balance sheet. And we, we operate those. And um, we've done three utility scale projects in the Berkshires. And those feed into the grid. Um, and uh, But, you know, there are limited numbers of of solar projects that can be developed in the Berkshires um, that are on scale to uh, this level, meaning a uh, utility scale project. And then that really has to do with the interconnectability of these type of projects. Um, we've consulted on several other projects as well, but just to give you all a sense that we're, we're, um, we're, we're, we're just, we don't see huge opportunity in the Berkshires for, for large scale solar. And it's predominantly because of the interconnectability of those projects in the Berkshires. So, all right, next slide, please. Um, some of our challenges in the region um, that I see, again, all of this is really coming from a developer's perspective and a developer standpoint. So, um, and maybe I'm missing something here, but um, what I see is, Deregulation from 1999 to 2005, and an effort to increase, you know, competition and 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 to reduce the cost to customers, um, that actually created some dynamics of play that are that are challenging for us as a region when we are in a deregulated environment. Um, we're also seeing decommissioning of electricity supply or generation. We're seeing that in, in Massachusetts and in the Northeast. And um, so, you know, when you think about that, what that means is that the generation of power is limited and in fact reducing. And the next bullet point is that there's increasing demand. That should say gigawatts, not megawatts, by the way. Uh, so there's a, a huge increase in the in the demand for electricity, you know, none of us are turning off our lights or our computers or our 
refrigerators or televisions, we're repurposing them. And so the, the house by house usage of electricity is going up. Um, the, the supply is going down. We know what happens when supply goes down and demand goes up. Well, you know, prices go up. Our transmission system and distribution system in the Massachusetts here in the Berkshires in particular is old and that creates challenges for us. And um, so another question that I ask us is, you know, is it time that we contemplate creating energy where it's used? And so, you know, we would very much like to see a world where we generate electricity, where we use it more. There are challenges to that. My last slide is the next one here. And um, so in the Berkshires, you know, we face some major challenges in the Berkshires. Um, as a lifelong resident of the Berkshires who has, you know, opted to build my businesses in the Berkshires, um, we have challenges in terms of nimbyism. People saying, you know, I don't want to see that. I don't want to look out my window and see wind turbines. I don't want to look out my window and see solar panels. It's just the way people are. So that's one of our challenges that we face. Um, as I mentioned before, there are limited wind resources here in the Berkshires. That creates some challenges for us. Um, certainly grid interconnection challenges. You know, we are in the Berkshires. We are a quilt of, you know, different communities being fed by different providers and grid and never source and so forth. And, and so when you get done with, you know, understanding that whole patchwork of how energy is generated and distributed and transmitted throughout the Berkshires, um, uh, then you overlay on top of that, that there are real interconnection challenges that we face with that grid operation here in the Berkshires. And it just creates a more complicated environment for us um, and so forth. Intermittency, meaning that the wind is not always blowing and the sun is not always out. Um, that gives rise to the need to solve. And this is not a Berkshire solution. Maybe it is, but we'll see. Um, this is a world problem, and that is storage. How do we store electricity cost effectively? And that is a big challenge. And there are some wonderful people, much smarter than myself, working on that. And hopefully they find solutions that will be a game changer. That will change everything. And maybe then that will open up some pockets of development in the Berkshires that we haven't seen yet. And then, um, you know, the last one really more is a question that is the local electricity production. Can we, can we find ways to produce that power where we use it? That's the name of the game as I see it. So um, I'm gonna leave it there and um, maybe weigh in on some other questions. Uh, they come at us later. James, do you want me to start with a question? Uh, if you have a direct question, there there are some questions uh, that have been submitted, but I think it would be better to go through the presentations and then we'll come to the whole session on questions. But if you have a question, please go ahead. No, I was just... Uh, um, I don't need to ask my question now. I, I'll, I'll wait and see whether it gets asked by the, the audience later. Okay, very good. So I suggest we continue. Okay, great. So we have our next speaker coming up. Will be uh, Pat Quinlan. He's a veteran of the renewable energy and energy. Of, he's a veteran renewable energy and energy patch. Uh, Energy Efficient Engineer, co-founder of Solar Block Inc. That's a manufacturer of solar masonry products and co-founder of Black Island Wind Turbines, a past manufacturer of small high reliability wind turbines used primarily in Antarctica. Um, he's gonna focus primarily on the solar outlook, and I look forward to your presentation. Hi, everybody. 
So um, uh, I'm, I'm Patrick Quinlan. Um, I'm going to switch to my slides now and see if uh, everybody can see them. Uh, let's go to, uh, there we go. Presentation and then um, let's see. I'm having trouble showing my, hold on. I have to switch my screen before I uh, apparently before I start my presentation. So let me do that. Yeah, you have to do the share screen part first, otherwise it gets confused. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, back to Zoom. And um, Apologize for this. Uh, my Zoom is not letting me. Here we go. Share screen. Okay. Does everybody see my screen now? Yes, it's not in the slide. There you go. Yeah, hit that. Okay. Seeing the full slideshow? It's I'm... still showing me the presenter view. Now, there is it is, that... perfect. Yeah. Okay, I apologize for the time taken. Um, so um, I'm an engineer, so uh, you've heard a lot about policy and development and uh, I think uh, what I try to do here is essentially uh, give people a, uh, a view of what the technology meaning is in the, in, over the next 10 years or so, because uh, we are gonna be entering what uh, some people have called the Cambrian era of solar, which is uh, just like with uh, biology took off in different ways when it uh, emerged on earth, uh, solar technologies are going to be doing the same thing. And so I'm going to give all of you a glimpse as to what's going to be showing up in, in Western Massachusetts and the Berkshires over the next 10 years that you might not even be aware of. So uh, anyway, so what does it mean for solar in the Berkshires? Um, for me, um, I am a, uh, uh, I've been working in renewable energy since 1987. Uh, and formerly was at the UMass Wind Energy Center, and I was an advisor to President Clinton on solar and wind technologies. Also was a, uh, an advisor to the House Ranking Member on the House Science Committee on uh, Renewables. I'm a former senior analyst at the National Renewable Energy Lab, and I worked for a very famous inventor, Paul McCready, who, uh, while I was there, invented the uh, solar powered airplane and the first human powered airplane and also uh, the GM Sun Racer, which was a fantastic electric vehicle. So um, I'm also uh, not representing my company or representing anything for consideration for uh, investment. So uh, get that out of the way. Um, Solarblock is the company I work for. This one slide, uh, we manufacture vertical solar systems. Um, we are in the middle, probably a month, six weeks away from getting our UL certifications we can sell on the market. And basically what we're doing is providing that on the building, right at the meter, energy production that will be available for commercial industrial buildings um, to provide both carbon mitigation and uh, on-site generation that will complement rooftop solar. We're not a competitor to rooftop solar. That's still the best economic play, but we do provide uh, significant options and opportunities for people who can't get enough or can't get any rooftop solar. So uh, we're positioned for that and look forward to being in that market next year. So I'm gonna give you the economic outlook, technology outlook and uh, other outlooks for what's going on. Um, especially with respect to the, uh, the Western Massachusetts situation. Um, first of all, 
uh, I think it's been alluded to, but we are going to be seeing some pretty sky high utility rates in the next few months um, due to global activity. Uh, the price of natural gas, which is the feedstock for a lot of our energy, electrical energy is going up. Um, and it is going to be a subject of tremendous conversation in the spring. So uh, be prepared for that. Um, but what I'm here to talk about is what is coming to hopefully save the day a bit. And that is cheaper solar, cheaper batteries, better tax credits for consumers and tax incentives for manufacturers. On the right side here, you can see the first graph in blue is the difference in cost from 2008 to 2019. In 11 years, we've gone from $4 per watt to 22 cents per watt for solar cells. This is a fantastic reduction. And the graph to the right of that, a little hard to see for those with small screens, but um, we've gone from $7 a watt installed for residential photovoltaics to $2.71. That is in 2020, and it's about that right now. What we're also looking at is the, the third graphic, our friendly banks. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but there are banks that actually provide solar loans, which in, in conjunction with uh, tax credits are really helpful for those of you who are considering a solar system. Uh, UMass 5 is just one example. I, I believe there's uh, two or three more across the Western part of the state. And then finally, um, cheaper batteries. I mentioned that uh, they're falling in price. Um, this is tremendously due to the automotive sector, which is driving the cost of batteries down. Also, batteries in buildings sometimes are the batteries that didn't qualify for the batteries in cars. So it's a really interesting uh, technology uh, play for us uh, to get solar to, to benefit from storage. So let's look at the technology outlook. I'm going to show you pictures one at a time just to get you a sense of things. Community solar, solar farms. Um, it was mentioned earlier that this is a is now an, an emerging NIMBY issue in Western Massachusetts, or uh, basically nationally. Um, I uh, worked in the wind industry and was exposed to NIMBY in the wind industry, and it was shocked to hear the same arguments made against solar. Um, it is uh, an issue, and it's going to be a very difficult policy issue for the state, which has uh, very aggressive solar farm, community solar uh, commitments uh, to, to make their, their those numbers that were quoted earlier today. Um, the other issue uh, that we all need, to, we're, we're gonna be aware of pretty soon is batteries. Um, about five years ago, very few solar customers had batteries installed as well. But uh, I just spoke to some people at Valley Solar uh, just a few days ago, and they're telling me that half of the people getting new solar are also getting battery systems for the buildings. And this is a huge change and uh, also reflects the costs and the, the money that people are willing to spend to become virtually uh, uh, very independent. Um, the other issue, uh, building integrated solar, this is what we provide, like SolarBlock. Um, it's part of the building. You can't take it off. You can't uh, do anything except it stays on the building. Um, really in interesting play uh, that we're a part of. Um, you know, we've seen solar carports, but they're actually going to be coming to your driveway if you want it. And this is uh, something that you might see uh, coming up in the next few years. Uh, it's not a big deal. And it's uh, one way to get solar, uh, a little more solar on your property. Floating solar is something maybe none of you have seen before in the western part of the state. This is actually a play that in addition to having um, pretty good sunlight, reduces the amount of evaporation from those uh, bodies of water. So this is a very popular potential play for, for the Western part of the country experiencing drought. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. You might see some uh, prototypes of that in, in waterways in the Western part of the state. Uh, the other issue, uh, urban solar. One of the great markets that we're seeing for solar block is just solar on the sides of buildings. It's not that bad. Once solar gets cheap enough, it's cheap to go anywhere. And on sides of buildings, even though we don't get as much sun as the roof, uh, there's a lot more surface area. And if it's economic for one square foot, it's going to be economic for the whole wall. So 
that's an interesting thing that you may start seeing more of in places like Boston. Um, Western Mass uh, is a center for what's called agrivoltaics, uh, the co-use of solar on farms while at the same time providing electrical energy and income for that farm owner. Um, there are a lot of plays. Some of it is for grazing, as you can see in this solution, but uh, I believe there's some UMass uh, test centers uh, that have sprung up in uh, Western Mass that are showing uh, crop production underneath these. Um, the, other, the other issue is uh, weather resiliency. We're seeing a lot more interest in having solar be there and ride out uh, the hurricane. So this article here actually shows what happened to a community that was right near Fort Myers in Florida that had zero damage to its solar panels and route out the storm without any problems and reduction in electricity. Um, automotive solar. This doesn't provide a lot of the solar, a lot of the electricity, I'm sorry, for the vehicle, but it does provide a little bit and uh, enough to make a difference. So you're gonna be seeing a little more solar roofs uh, on vehicles in the next 10 years. And then finally, um, there's a new technology, perovskite, I knew I'd blow them, but uh, it is a form of solar energy that's very different from what's being produced now and has the potential to reduce the cost by several factors. Um, it's very exciting. Um, the labs are all over this. The problem right now is longevity, and um, I think they're going to solve this problem pretty soon. Um, so on a regulatory basis, I know uh, we discussed some of this already earlier today, but the Inflation Reduction Act raises the, uh, the incentives. And folks are going to see those incentives in addition to the smart SREX and REX payments that they may be getting from solar from the investor owned utilities. There are fewer programs from the municipal utilities, uh, but there is one the municipal light plant solar rebate program. Um, the country, the, the people in the hill towns are going to be really much more affected by uh, rate increases and they've got to find a way to. To, to reduce their costs. And this is one of the programs that will help defer the cost of solar. And then finally, uh, sorry about that. Um, batteries are gonna be more highly regulated because lithium ion batteries present a fire hazard. So there are efforts to try to get uh, a little bit more construction, maybe putting them in closets, that kind of thing, which is gonna raise their cost. Uh, the Advancing Commonwealth Energy Storage Program in Massachusetts is one of those initiatives that's gonna make sure it's safe. But Altogether, uh, there's a whole portfolio of support for doing solar if you want to do it. So my solar outlook for the Berkshires is that we're going to see major increases in the solar value proposition because of the reduced cost of solar and the skyrocketing cost of, uh, of residential utility power. Um, I'm anticipating over the, ten, the next 10 years pretty easily a doubling of overall solar adoption per year from what we see now. And with that, the increased percentage are, are going to include batteries, basically because the costs are falling and because uh, the utilities, because they are stretched, I totally agree with uh, what was said earlier about the fact that the, the, the distribution system in Western Massachusetts is old, it is constrained, it has minimized uh, some of the uh, potential project plans. And we're going to be suffering from that uh, in, in, in terms of seeing some slightly reduced reliability. And solar NIMBY is going to be an emerging issue, and it's going to be crashing into the state renewable energy goals. Um, you're going to see more about that um, as we go forward. And then finally, um, emerging social equity issues. The people who can afford solar are doing pretty well, but the people who can't are going to have to pay those full utility bills. And many of those people are in um, disadvantaged locations or communities of color. And it is gonna be something we have to address in terms of social equity. So that's my uh, outlook for what's going on in uh, solar that's gonna be coming up in the next few years in the local area. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna stop my... Uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. So uh, we have next up uh, Dave Lewis 
founder and CEO of Move EV. Uh, the goal of Move EV is to offer structured electric vehicle adoption benefits and manage plans for corporate decarbonization. Um, so I look forward to the presentation. Take it away. Hey, uh, this is David Lewis. Hope you all can hear me okay. And I hope the, the screen share looks good. Maybe a thumbs up for my fellow presenters. I'm really, really happy to be batting clean up here. Um, uh, Tom Pat and uh, Tyler really uh, set the stage well for me. Um, focusing today's presentation, we'll go into a little bit about what we do at Move EV, but uh, we're going to try to focus at least the first half on electric vehicles and, and what's in it for you in the Berkshires. A bit about me, I'm a Berkshire native. I grew up in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, you may, I may have served you breakfast at Martin's restaurant. I don't know if you guys remember that place. Uh, that's my dad's, that was my dad's place. Um, but, uh, you know, since the Berkshires, you know, I was, per my uh, introduction, I was a banker for a while. I went to business school. And then I've been a software operator in town here. And the pro pr problem we focus on is, you know, why are we lagging other countries in EV adoption and we shouldn't. And, you know, if we want to remain the, the leader here globally, then we really need to be the leader in electric vehicle adoption. Um, so we're going to just, we, and we try to accelerate that for companies. So just in Massachusetts and, and Tom helped set the stage for this, but our driving emissions, a big deal in Massachusetts. And, you know, as I dive in here, we're going to, I'm just going to have to preface this with I have two little girls. I believe in climate change and I'm worried about it. And the reason why we're working on EV adoption is we think that it's like kind of the one change you can make to make a difference right now. Solar is also huge and I love it. So what SolarBlock do, is doing is wildly innovative and I, and I really appreciate it. And, uh, and my parents live near a, a, uh, a bunch of solar panels and it's totally fine with me. We still walk the dog and enjoy the farms. Moving to Massachusetts, is it a big deal? Tom pointed this out. I use 42%, he used 37. But the biggest emitter is transportation, right, in Massachusetts. And half of that is cars, and half that is just commuting to work. You know, in the Berkshires, you all drive more than normal, um, but you certainly drive uh, to get to work. Nobody walks to work, relative comparison, very few people walk to, uh, walk to work in the Berkshires. Um, and you tend to drive a lot because things are further away. And that's not good for the environment. And it's terrible for your wallet. So on the environmental side, is driving a big deal in Massachusetts? Yes. It's the largest emission sector. How about for you personally? Well, the EPA estimates that it's about 25% of your emissions if you drive a regular car. It's, it's actually a little bit more. Um, here we're using an average person driving 16,000 miles a year, which all the folks on the phone probably do. We're assuming you drive SUVs because you live in the Berkshires, so not getting a super high MPG. And you're emitting quite a bit. The average person in America emits 16 metric tons uh, in a year. And so here you can see it's almost half for you Berkshire drivers. Also, gas is crazy expensive. So just to recap the last section, Gas is crazy bad for the environment. It's the worst thing any of us do every day for the environment. Gas is crazy expensive. I don't think this became more obvious in this year. Uh, in my assumptions here, I use an average price of 388, but I just looked on the website and it looks like gas is about four and a quarter in Pittsfield today. So how expensive is gas? And again, this is after tax money. So again, if you're driving 16,000 miles a year, this is your MPG at 388 a gallon, you're spending almost $3,500 a year of after-tax money on gas. And you might ask me, is that a lot of money? Well, I'm sure you're having dinner table conversation around it, but the average salary in Pittsfield is $52,000. So the after-tax salary in Pittsfield is, I don't know, 40, 35. So you're talking about 10% of your actual income going to gas. Just something to think about. And in my last company, I studied this for a long time. I was head of strategy at a business. It's, it's the largest reimbursement company in the country for driving for work. And so I know a lot about people that drive for work and spend a lot of money on uh, gas, especially for work. 
So I just said that it was expensive, but could you save money by going electric? And again, this is in the what's in it for you, right? Let's put aside any cultural objections you may have or that you've been saving up a long time because you really want to buy a BMW. Let's just put that aside for a moment. Could you save money by going electric? So in that last example I showed you, you were spending 3,500 bucks a year on gas. For the electricity equivalent, you could spend about 1,200 bucks. Right, so every year you get to save $2,300 of after-tax money and go on vacation or put that in your 529 plan for your kid or put it in your 401k. And again, the only thing you get for spending on gas instead of electricity is 25% of your carbon footprint. Right, so it's basically, I think about it as just, you know, right now everyone's driving around smoking packs of cigarettes in their car spending $15 on a pack of cigarettes every day. Why don't we just stop that? So it really is a big deal for people that don't make a bunch of money, which is the vast majority of people in the Berkshires, right, are living paycheck to paycheck. And I'm keenly aware of this, having grown up in a restaurant and worked in one for 20 years of my life, right? Uh, so what's in it for you? Here's the big ticket item, total cost of ownership. This is over a five-year period, right? It can mean $24,000 more in your wallet. And what's hilarious is the state of Massachusetts is still writing checks for 2,500 bucks if you buy one of these things. And the federal government, it was great that we were talking about solar, but the incentives here are greater. At $7,500, right, per vehicle. And then I showed you, you save a bunch of money on gas every year. Again, this is a low estimate of five years. And your maintenance goes way down. This is the thing that actually sold me after replacing three transmissions in other cars is that there's 2,000 less parts in an electric car, right? So there's just a lot fewer things to break. So again, this conversation is just about, hopefully folks on the phone will think a little bit about buying an electric vehicle, either because they wanna save money, or like I showed you before, that they care about the environment, okay? Um, and these incentives will go away, just to be clear. Although the government just signed up to do them for another 10 years, in the UK, they're already going away. We're very lucky right now because we just get to catch up to other countries. So I'm sure these questions will come up, but the technology is further developed than we're giving it credit for in this country. The reason why they're beginning to stop benefits in the UK is because they're already at about 12% adoption. So why are we lagging? Anyway, so that's, that's a little bit what's in it for you. Kind of what, what do we do on a day-to-day -day is like we're working on the sort of 120 million vehicles that drive to work or for work, right? There's 280 million vehicles in the US, 2 million of them are EVs. That's a big change to happen in a 15 year period. And so why we exist is because there's lots of questions around it and we have some nice answers and we want people to change faster because it's just better for them and everyone else. Typically, we go into uh, an engagement with a corporation. We work with corporations that have 20, 200,000 employees, and we work with local governments that have you know, 500 employees. So uh, for a variety of different reasons, but basically it often starts with gas is super expensive. Is there anything we can do? Yes, right? Hey, is gas really bad for the environment? Is there anything we can do? Yes. Can not spending money on gas help us achieve business goals? Yes. And is it true how much we can really save on gas versus electricity? And the answer is yes. And what we do is we basically soup to nuts, make it as easy for the company and the end user to get to an electric vehicle because it is very complicated and annoying. You know, top 10 annoying things you do in your lifetime is buy a car 10 times, right? So uh, we make it Basically, we take the pressure out of it. We're not selling you a vehicle. We're just trying to educate folks and be a phone to call, right? I, if you think about uh, a lot of reasons, one of the problems we're solving is that the vast majority of the country, over 70% of folks get a vehicle when their car breaks or when their lease is up. And because of supply chain issues, without proper planning, that means you can't get into an EV. So we make software, right? B2B software, and the software helps a corporation offer electric, electric uh, benefits. And they usually do that because they're trying to build sustainability culture. And there's a hunger within their employee base for their company to be doing something for the environment that includes them. 
And we also calculate and remo remove emissions related to either driving for work or to work. Driving to work is 10% of all emissions in the country just by order of magnitude. For the end user, we make the journey for them super clean. This example was a Jeep. You get your own user login. We show you a lot about your current vehicle. And then we plan so that over time you can adopt an electric vehicle when it makes sense for you. And folks really like this so they can plan to get their F-150 two and a half years in advance, which is kind of when we'd start having you plan right now based on supply chain. And it may sound ridiculous, but making a plan now is gonna make you successful in your transition later and allow you to start, start saving money on gas, which is really what this is all about. And just sort of how we position ourselves is that all these aggressive state goals that Tom brought up and a lot of corporations, there's uh, like you know, um, 2,500 public corporations that have pledged to get to some level of zero at some time. And part of it has to be every vehicle they touch is electric, otherwise it's impossible to get there. And so what we say is that we are the only benefit, corporate benefit that focuses on your employees first and offers them real financial benefits, even though these other strategies to decarbonize are pretty good, you know, can be pretty effective. Uh, they definitely have their place and are great. Don't stop doing them. But addition to that, let's start focusing on this sort of really impactful long-term hard one, which is how do we get everyone to drive to work in an electric vehicle? And I'm just gonna clean it up there. I could talk to you for hours. Hopefully I have some interesting questions, but I'd say check us out at movieV.com. Um, and I'm happy to help you if you have a company that's interested in learning more about this, or if you're just a person interested in learning about how do you get your benefits, your federal or your state benefits, or you wanna talk about some of these cars, uh, I'm happy to do it. Um, and thank you for your time. I'll, I'll leave it there. Wow. So Tom, <clears throat> do you have any immediate questions? There are some questions I can raise. Um, is there anything you would like to raise first? So, um overall i think um we we covered a lot of themes here um i would um uh, like to ask the group you know if you you know if you could change one thing to try to make your business or uh, you can change one policy, um, what, what would you do um, to help reduce greenhouse emissions that would affect the Berkshires? So it uh, doesn't matter who we start with. Maybe David, you went last. Why don't you go first? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. I don't, I mean, I think one thing is always, <laughs> it's always sort of challenging. Okay. You can come up but, with one, three, but here, three here, one here, I'll, I'll give you one. So we also teach this in public schools. And I would say that if it could be part of the curriculum that we teach sustainable living, you know, and um, sort of cost benefit analysis and financial decision making in schools, I think both solar and EV adoption uh, would get a lot of would gain a lot of ground that way. Okay. Patrick, um, I would like to see a, uh, a, a sort of requirement to look at solar for the walls of new schools um, and other uh, uh, state buildings. Um, We've seen so many times where a school has used, uh, or it's just been built this last year or two, with uh, high cost materials that are even more expensive than a solar block wall would have been. And to the extent that uh, if they had used our product, the operating expenses would have been reduced to the extent they could hire a teacher. So we think that's a market failure that would be very well addressed by just actually costing out that alternative and to have people look at it. So thank you. And Tyler, I think you might have to unmute. Here we go. Can you hear me? 
Yes. All right, good. Um, yeah, I, to me, the, the, the panacea is um, storage. You know, it's so anything, everything that we can do to spark development and advancement, I would say advancement more in the realm of storage. That's where I think we should be focusing our energies collectively. Okay, James, that, those were all really good. Good answers. Uh, James, you want to tee up the questions from the audience? Yeah, there are some questions. The first one came up for you. How clean is our electricity supply in Berkshire County? Question from Matthew Miller. Well, um, Berkshire County is part of the um, New England electric grid. So, uh, it's really um, hard to see where those electrons come from. But in the state of Massachusetts, as of 2022, 24% uh, of the electricity produced has to come from new, clean, renewable energy resources. So basically non-carbon emitting resources. Um, so about, it's about a quarter um, are non-emitting resources. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Here's a question from uh, Bob Braddock. Uh, this is a question for Tyler. You indicated that financing is the number one challenge. Would you trace the process over the last five years? Has it become more difficult recently? with the change in capital and lending terms, what is the balance between private and public funding availability? That is a very complicated question, a very insightful question, love it. Um, I would say that, that um, you know, there are a, a variety of, of uh, challenges right now that we are facing in terms of financing. And it's really um, the, the the tax, uh, it's so complicated, but the tax credits that are so important to the development of renewable energy projects um, are, are the, they're not, they're, you need an, a player, a third party player to help take advantage of those tax credits. Typically it's a very large institutional player and that becomes the biggest bogey of the whole thing, is trying to get those projects financed and get somebody to monetize the tax credits become some of the biggest challenges that there are. Okay. Um, another question for Tyler from Matthew Miller. Uh, you, the question is, if our electricity is, is not clean, generated with low zero carbon fuels, it seems like your firms and with your know-how, you could drive the move to clean electricity and even make the county energy independent. Uh, and it seems he said that you partly answered that question, but how do you do that? Okay, um, so making, I mean, so deregulation means that you have to generate power where you use it if you're going to generate it. You can't generate it and sell it across property boundaries. That's illegal. You can't do that. So trying to make a town or a state or, or, or a region like the Berkshires um, completely self-sufficient with the renewable energies becomes very challenging because you need to generate that power where you're using it. Or, I'm sorry, generate it yeah, where you're using it. And there are just not the, the areas with the appetite to do such a thing. So uh, gosh, I would love it. It would be wonderful if, we, if the Berkshires were, were completely off the grid and, and green and clean. And you know that would be a fantastic thing. But boy, we have not seen how to do that yet. If somebody has, Great idea. I would love to hear it. Love it. <laughs> okay. And now another question um, from Bob Reddick. Would you explain what the interconnectability challenges are 
in the Berkshires, for example, the ability to get the electric utilities to play. Yeah, that that um, that has been probably the biggest challenge for us as a developer um, is getting anything, whether it's a wind turbine or whether it's a, a commercial or a utility scale uh, solar facility to plug into the grid is a big challenge. And, and the, you know, the, 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 when I mean the grid, we think the grid is this, you know, big thing out there, but you know, it's the utilities that we have to plug into and going through that process of interconnecting projects is a very, very intensive time and money consuming effort that sometimes doesn't pay dividends and it becomes really challenging for us as developers to, to do that kind of thing. So um, interconnectability is one of the bigger challenges. I could go on and on and I won't um, about what those challenges are, but we have, we have certainly had our fair share of challenges with the interconnectability of projects. Right, right. A question for Pat. Would you comment on the battery arena? Is this all about lithium? And what is the state of progress? Sure. Um, it has been all about lithium. Um, there are uh, variants of lithium batteries that uh, are more are better suited for, for static applications instead of electric cars. Um, what's What's really great about batteries is that there's a huge startup community of alternative battery formulations that's still working their way up the, 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 uh, the development cycle. Um, many people have thought that uh, the lithium mining aspect of lithium in the world is going to be a choke point. Um, I just learned this fascinating story that uh, they've discovered uh, a huge amount of lithium under the Salton Sea in California, which may be uh, uh, enough to supply the US for 50 years. So I think it's a matter of diversifying the battery technologies into other technologies. Um, there are a lot of them and they are uh, really promising. Um, but the big thing is that the automotive industry is driving so hard to produce low cost, batteries that don't weigh very much. And it's always pushing for lithium. So the low cost stuff is always gonna be for the time being lithium based, but we're gonna see comp competitors. Uh, there are these flow batteries and zinc air batteries and all of that. Uh, we're just at the beginning of that. And I'm glad for it because we need to address what Tyler's talking about to make this work. Yeah. Another question uh, from Marietta. She said, we cannot find an EV to look at in Berkshire County. So what do you say about that? Is that to me? I assume that might be to me. Of course, yeah. that's the town. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I feel for you. That's sort of, that's one of the main reasons why we exist, right? And it just shouldn't be that annoying for you. And so if you're corporate, if your employer was trying to help you figure this out, you would you would be able to find one and, and drive one and, and look and feel and touch one. Um, so that's a supply chain issue yeah. um, that we help companies solve. Um, and uh, I mean, we can talk offline. I can I can find you on a drive if you like. Uh, Reels, okay, do you want me to just go down the list here? The next question is real issues with accessibility of charging stations impedes EV growth. Yes, that's Double. what I was gonna ask. Double exclamation point from Robert. Um, I love the excitement. Uh, I would challenge that. Um, I think, you know, one of the best things about driving an electric car is charging at home or at work. And I would argue if you, if you don't have the ability to charge at home or at work, it could be an issue. Um, but if you do have the ability to charge at home or at work, it's incredible because that means you never ever go to the gas station. Instead of going to the gas station literally 50 times a year and taking $70, $80 out of your wallet, 
you just go home and spend 12 bucks. Yeah. So that I, you know, basically we, we help everyone with their own charging plan. So if you don't have the ability to install one at home or charge at work, then we'll help you figure out if there's a good option and there may not be. Right. And another question for you here from Ben Sosny, aside from the high costs of gasoline, to what do you attribute higher rates of EV adoption in Europe? Such a great question. Um, in most of the countries where there is robust EV adoption, there are corporate programs. And so we look at this country, you know, they look at it as uh, something that the country is doing and their way of giving tax benefits is by offering corporate provided um, tax benefits that are similar to like a healthcare spend account where you can use tax-free dollars to make lease payments on your electric vehicle. So in the UK, you can lease, let's say a Jaguar F-Pace um, for the same price that you would lease like a much lesser uh, combustion car because you're using after-tax dollars for the combustion car. So one, there are corporate programs, which is why we're introducing corporate programs to the US. Uh, and two, gas can be a lot more expensive there. Yeah. An additional question. The, you talked about saving savings on EV. Do you contemplate the relatively high and growing electric costs in the Berkshires in considering that? Totally. Um, I think, you know, a lot of these questions are, we're just trying to solve this one problem, right? So right now it's a year, people are spending $3,500 a year on gas. It's terrible for the environment. It's terrible for their wallet. And so right now, if you can get yourself into an electric car, you get all the benefits. Later on, electricity may go up wildly more than gas. I don't know, because gas basically doubled this year, but it could. And then you want to have like Tyler and Pat-like solutions which are, can I produce my own? And most of where I think we're going, and most folks may probably believe this on the call, is that it is getting decentralized. And I do think in the future that there will be a lot more of this micro production of electricity and this micro storage from the statistics we got from Pat about solar installation and batteries being provided at his house. So um, I don't know. But in the short term, you're definitely going to benefit. I would expect, and again, this is just my opinion, I think owning a gas car is going to become vastly more expensive over time as the supply chain breaks down, right? At, because it's a volume business. As volume goes down, I think price is going to go up. And then also, if the world continues to destabilize, I hope it doesn't, these shocks will continue. Um, but all the governments... And I think a lot of these, these are all pro solvable problems, I'd like to say, and they will all be solved. I think a lot of this is cultural. And what some people have realized and others haven't yet is that the government of the United States with this Inflation Reduction Act has told the United States that we are moving to electric vehicles. And the sooner you get on board, the better off you're gonna be. It's no longer an if, it's a when. And so as soon as you can start thinking with that mentality, uh, you're going to be better off. I just want to also say this. The reason we've had a very top-down approach on electric vehicle adoption in this country, where vast majority of electric vehicles sold have been Teslas, and those are generally expensive cars bought by people with a lot of discretionary income. That is all going to change. And our view is a way that we can change that systemically is by getting corporations involved because in this country, corporations have a lot of power. And as you know, the only reason why anyone has healthcare and 401k retirement is this country is because of their employers. And similarly, if we want them to make other lifestyle changes like sustainable lifestyle changes as been proven in Europe and other places, we really need the corporations to get involved. Yeah, um, <clears throat> on the subject of wind energy, uh, one person asked, please discuss large scale development of offshore wind projects. Well, I don't think we're going to see any of that in the Berkshires. No, not in the Berkshires. No, I'm, te I'm teasing. You know, this was supposed to be 
there, there is a huge amount of offshore wind um, going on all over the East Coast. Um, California just opened up leases. Um, uh, floating wind turbines are letting um, uh, the uh, the put it into deeper and deeper water. Um, so it is a major, if you go back to my the initial presentation, uh, we didn't break it down, but it's a major part of the expected um, greening of the New England grid. Um, those prices, like everything else, where there's a lot of um, investment, those prices have been going down um, substantially. Uh, I don't know if I have a lot more to say about it. It has higher capacity factors. It produces more energy per peak technical output because the winds are um, uh, are stronger and steadier out in the ocean. Um, so there's a lot. Um, New England is counting on um, offshore wind, as is New York and other mid-Atlantic states. Would you say there's a big infrastructure issue related to that? Uh, absolutely. Um, we don't have the, uh, while we're building the ports to um, service offshore wind turbines, um, we don't have the fleet to service those turbines right now. Um, those, uh, they have to be under, I forget what, you know, is it the Magnuson Act? I forget what it is. Uh, they have to be under US flag. Um, and uh, the, most of those, most of that fleet is European. Right, okay. Um, another question, uh, if there is a recession now and more companies are struggling to survive, do you think that there will be fewer companies that consider doing their part for decarbonization to be a major priority? Would they be giving up? Is that to me? Well, it can be anybody, but it could be you. Um, I'll go. I, I would say that if you're, I'd answer the questions a couple of times, a couple of ways. It's just good business to pay for electricity instead of gas, period. It just saves you money. Yeah. So it, it, in a recession, especially one with high inflation for on gas prices, it's, it makes a ton of sense right away uh, to replace all gas cars that you can with uh, electric. And in a corporation, you know, if they have a fleet that they provide, they replace these vehicles periodically. And so pushing some EVs into that natural life cycle is just good business for them in terms of saving on gas. And gas is generally 30% of the total cost of ownership of that car, right? And they can reduce that portion um, significantly. So I think it's good business. And then I think those companies that have made these pledges will continue to find ways to cut carbon. Um, I hope, but I, I agree that if the only reason why a company is doing something is to cut carbon and it doesn't help them with any of their other goals, I could see those projects being pushed for sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, one final question, we're running out of time. It was this question for Pat. Uh, how much electricity is generated in the Berkshires now and how much is consumed by the building owner and how much flows to the grid? Right, I, I, I assume Matthew's talking about the solar electricity aspect of that. Yeah. Uh, so my first thought is that it's important for, for people to understand that the grid is actually all of New England, everything that's in ISO New England service area. Um, so if you put a, you put a drop of water in that pool, it's distributed across the entire New England uh, grid. So um, uh, I would say that within that, um, we're looking at a combination of uh, what's, what's called community solar. And a lot of those are grid tied directly. The owners of those uh, basically have shares that go to individuals. 
and many times those are net metered to those people. So um, in a way, uh, most electricity goes to those individuals before it gets on the grid. So um, the other uh, type of solar basically on the building in a commercial or residential setting, for the most part, almost all of that meets local loads. So uh, what's net on the grid uh, that went to wholesale production is, is quite low. I don't have the gigawatt numbers, but I know, uh, I think ISO New England's up in the 30 gigawatt to 40 gigawatt uh, total amount. We have a long way to go before we chip away at that total number. Uh, yeah. But producing it on site defers the cost of retail electricity, which is the high value stuff. Once it goes through that meter, you're paying full price. And if you don't have to pay full price, that's really great. Once it goes on the grid, it's a wholesale rate and you don't get that much for it. So you don't really wanna put it on the grid if you don't have to. What you wanna do is cover your entire usage. That's the bright point for most people. Um, and the ethical one though, is do a little more than your own usage. So you can cover that, those people that can't put solar on their roofs because they're in a shaded area. So if we wanna to get to what uh, people are hoping for, which is a net zero region, uh, we all have to do our share. And it's all gonna be with each of these solutions, all of them done at once. It's gonna take everybody, all this entire panel working, plus new people coming on board to achieve that. Um, but th that gigawatt, those gigawatt numbers are gonna be really hard to take down, even though we have state and, uh, New England commitments to take those numbers down, the, the reality in the field is going to be a real, real tough nut to crack. Yeah. Well, we've reached uh, just about the end, and I just want to ask if there are any final comments that anyone would like to make. Tom, others, are there some final thoughts before we close? Uh, I Someone brought up uh, that uh, the IRA Act um, Inflation Reduction Act. It's going to make a huge difference. Um, and it's going to provide partial solutions to many of the, or incentives to get over um, many of the issues we talked about tonight. Um, I'm, it's going to incent uh, transmission systems. It's obviously incenting uh, renewables, um, energy efficiency. Uh, electric cars. Um, so uh, that that is a huge deal. Um, so uh, I think that and technological progress, um, one should be optimistic that we can actually achieve our greenhouse gas reduction goals. Well, thank you for enabling us to end on a positive note. And uh, we, we thank you all very much from Ali. This is uh, excellent input and uh, well, thank you and uh, good evening and look forward to continuing our conversation. Thank you, James. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all, it's a pleasure. <laughs>